Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Energy Storage News webinar with TWICE, where we'll be learning about the valuable and perhaps soon to be essential role cloud-based battery analytics, analytics can play in the commissioning and in-life operation of stationary battery storage assets. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor of Energy Storage News here at Solar Media. I've been writing about energy storage and its role in the energy transition for close to a decade now. And there are a lot of things about it that make energy storage an exciting and interesting industry to cover, as I'm sure all of you know. It's not just because of the rapid growth of the industry and scale up of the many companies involved. And it's not just because of the transformative impact energy storage is having on the electricity sector from enabling decarbonization and greater shares of renewable energy and seeing it happen in more and more places around the world and in more and more ambitious ways. It is, of course, about all of those things. But what continues to make it really interesting for me is that this young industry has progressed to a level of maturity where we are not only seeing continuous innovation, but we're also able to look deeper into those innovations and learn firsthand from some of the people creating and taking them to market. Today's webinar is another great example of that. Digital commissioning may sound futuristic, but it's a topic very much for today. And as you will hear from our expert speakers, the application of cloud-based battery analytics can greatly reduce the pain points of making an asset successful from the very start. By making more accurate data available in the early stages of a project's life cycle, you can better empower your decision making while the role battery analytics can play in ensuring that success goes on long into operation for the whole lifetime of the asset. Joining us today are Sebastian Becker, TWICE's Director of Industrial Partnerships and Strategy, I, Sebastian, and Ryan Franks, Senior Technical Solution Engineer at TWICE. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Andy. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks. As always, interaction with you, the audience, is very, very important to us. You can put your questions for Sebastian and Ryan into the questions tab on the right hand side of your screen. And we will host a Q&A, an audience Q&A to follow their presentation. Now, we can't promise to answer all of your questions within the short time we have today, although we'll try and do as many as we can. But the team at TWICE will be happy to pick up questions and carry on conversations with you offline. Sebastian Ryan's email addresses will be up on screen again later. And you can also visit the company's website at www.twice, that's T-W-A-I-C-E dot com. So that's enough preamble from me. Thanks again to all of you for joining us, whether live today or on demand later. And I'd like to hand over to our first speaker now. Over to you, Sebastian. Thanks, Andy. And hello, everyone. Um... Also from my side, so we are starting with a quick update, reminder on what TWICE offers before starting with the official part of the webinar. So we all know that batteries are the enabler and most of us also are aware that they are the Achilles heel of the transition to green energy and mobility. And the TWICE vision and value proposition is to get more out of the battery. Yeah, and we do this with the help of a scalable cloud platform. So we help customers with challenges they have along the value chain. So where are we at at our journey currently? Yeah, so we've grown twice to a team of 100 people globally. Ryan in the US in Chicago, I'm here in Munich. And yeah, a lot of our work is protected by patents and we continue to work on research and IP. Many partners that trust on our software and build their own products on, on top of ours have been already onboarded and uh, so are a lot of batteries. Yeah, a lot of batteries already connected in the field. Um, and we, it's not only because of the in-life data that we connect via our platform, also because our in-house battery lab, right next to our offices, we make sure to, to understand batteries as, as good as possible, as good as we can. So um, now coming to the official part. So the market ramps up quickly and will continue to do so. So, and what might seem like a typical start into 
into a presentation is something I really cannot highlight often enough. So the market has quadrupled over the past two years. So since 21 to 23 and will continue to do so in the future. So just showing you the Im impressive ramp up that is going to happen over the next years. So why is that short answer today only because of the global increase in renewables? Yeah, so there will be a need for 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 battery storage to to support that growth. And of course, while I want to put noble motives to to all of you, I also want to highlight that, of course, a lot of money is and will be earned with battery storages. So. And as the storages usually run without a lot of human interaction, do we encounter the following? Everybody's happy and we can go play foosball and webinar is over. Well, not quite. I mean, you certainly could go and play foosball and spin those poles, but unfortunately, there are quite a bit of number of problems. In fact, if you want to make money and you go on and you revisit that 20x in growth, Currently, a 20 megawatt hour storage system is about eight to $12 million in capital costs. And if we extrapolate that over the next 20 years, and as you were saying, do a 20X, anybody who's developing storage, any stakeholder is going to really want to assess the risks that are present in building energy storage. And then Sebastian, how does the effort really scale with that? Yeah, so yeah, it's and it's not only about the price for storage, it's also about the effort for actually making sure that the project is deployed correctly as you bought it. So commissioning the storage and handing it over to the owner can be a standardized process mm -hmm. and without too many insights, let's say. However, if done properly, the effort is quite high. And we will come to that later, what we mean with properly. But my my my, my main message here is so doing it properly is not really scalable already as of today. Yeah, and today we are in 2023 and we have already deployed um, like average deployment size of 170 megawatt hour. Looking into 24, it will be likely 230 megawatt hour and it will again double until 25, so 500 megawatt hours. So what I'm, my main message here is um, really that in the future, you need a process and tools that are scalable Otherwise, your effort will be extremely high to making sure if you want to do it properly again. Ryan, handing over to you. Yeah, thanks. So to talk specifically about some of these problems, this is an exemplary case where a customer, a, a large utility in Europe, uh, employed twice analytics and digital commissioning. And what they discovered was what you see in front of you is a temperature heat map. And these sort of problems would never have been picked up necessarily uh, in the regular commissioning process. Uh, what they discovered was that there were really anomalous temperature spreads within strings that were occurring in the energy storage system. And the system had just begun operating. So they entered the system based upon the alerts that we provided them. And immediately upon entering the energy storage system, they were confronted with very direct visual evidence, something so simple, but uh, it was just misdone during the actual build of the energy storage system. In fact, the screws for the fuses had not been completely tightened to the control panel, which was causing overheating on some, sort, on some of the strings. And then, moreover, when they looked next to the control panel where the fuses, fuse screws were missing, they discovered that there was a missing connection in the fire suppression system. Of course, maybe this fire suppression system would have activated with the high temperatures, but it simply wasn't. So in, in summary here, we in this particular case with this utility, uh, there were several weak cells that were, were identified and this type of behavior would never have been, uh, it really wasn't in line with what the battery specifications were. But if we look and go on, there are really three things, there are three types of risks that we, we really want to evaluate here. Um, the first, if you go on, Sebastian, sorry. Yeah, the, the first is, is problems at the beginning. So the first risk here is this data is taken from the EPRI Sandia Energy Storage Incident Database. And what this shows here is that 58%, in fact, of energy storage incidents occur within the first two years. 
Uh, so it's uh, simply a lot of things to, to uh, protect and take into consideration at the beginning. The second uh, instance here, if you go on, is availability. So this problem that pops up, I, I've had a number of conversations over the past uh, six months, especially with the proliferation of energy storage systems when they reach two, three, four, five, seven years in maturity. Uh, they face a lot of availability issues. Uh, here you can see a couple of quotes. This is from a consulting firm uh, that pegged energy storage availability in the UK at a mere 82%. And you can imagine the lost revenue from that. Uh, in, in the second quote there is from a U.S. asset owner. Uh, there was only 84% availability in the U.S. <clears throat> in fact, just last week, I was talking to an asset owner at uh, the Clean Power in New Orleans, a big trade show, and his remark was 90%. We would die for 90% availability. He's, he's facing a ton on very, very large uh, energy storage systems in the hundreds to uh, hundreds of megawatt hours to, to gigawatt hours. And then if we go on, the third risk here is that I, I'm sure that Andy and his colleagues at Energy Storage News do appreciate the content from energy storage system failures, uh, but it's really not the best type of PR, unfortunately. And so, I, I, you know, Andy, I, I hope, that, uh, hope that people uh, can avoid those sort of safety incidents so that you have to write about something else. Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I will honestly admit that when we write about bad incidents, it's we get a lot of website traffic. And, you know, if I was a much more selfish person than I am, that would be a good thing for me. But it's the last thing we want to be writing about. Um, but to be honest, it's something we can't ignore. So, you know, we think everything that can be done to make sure this just isn't something that we, we have to be writing about is a good thing, really, I guess. But uh Nonetheless, thanks for the uh, thanks for the heads up and mentioning myself and Cameron in the, in your webinar presentation. So, you know, we've talked about this kind of initial risk with the beginning of systems. We talk about this persistent risk in maturity and the overall sort of background risk of safety incidents. Sebastian, where do we come in? Yes. So, um, of course, uh, as you might assume, we wouldn't be here today if we only wanted to, to talk about the problems. We are here because we believe that actually that market ramp up that you saw on the uh, first slide uh, is still too conservative because there's actually quite a few things that can be done against these risks that Ryan just mentioned. And to be more precise, so what I mean, so measures to de-risk the deployment and operation of the battery storage. So if we begin, um, with the deployment um, with a solution that we name digital commissioning. Yeah, so once connected to our cloud platform, the digital commissioning service is provided. So you or maybe also your client will receive a report su summarizing the insights. So, and this is really helpful to have a smooth, a smooth start into the operation. So why is that? Yeah, so you will get basically an action plan that helps you to um, to know what to do before the acceptance of the site of the project. So and it will help you to have all the important battery related info in this document that you just see here, like weak cells, cooling system configuration, BMS problems, or unbalanced cells or anything alike. And all this while the EPC or who, whoever is doing the commissioning for you is still on site. And yes, it can potentially delay the process, but what we say it's better to have the personal so to do it when the personal is still on site and later in time yeah when the asset is being operated and this is already also so talking about this asset being operated so after this ideal start you want to keep the availability at the highest yeah so we we, we come again to the availability part and you want to operate your storage by adding battery analytics to your operation so this is where our solution again improves battery health and safety and as well as our warranty tracker um, comes into play yeah to 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 see that you really do not lose your warranty overall ryan handing handing over to you thanks sebastian yeah so to revisit here uh I wanted to take you to two case studies. Uh, the first is a approximately 20-ish hour megawatt, hour megawatt hour system uh, at a utility. And they employed Twice Analytics. 
And really what you're doing with this digital commissioning process is that you're taking the data that is streaming off of the system during the commissioning, the normal commissioning process and gaining additional insights. And, and really what you get is five things. Uh, you get voltage and temperature spreads, round trip efficiency, uh, capacity <clears throat> and uh, DC resistance. So that last key one may sound fairly simple. It's purely a calculation, but it's not something that is typically taken into account and it can be high, highly emblematic of, of problematic behavior. The graph that you see in front of you is just on one string. There were several strings that were problematic, uh, but you can clearly see that red line there. This is a graph of DC resistance uh, ver versus pulse time after pulse tests, which occurred during the commissioning process. And you can see that outlier red line. Uh, and while it may seem elevated, keep in mind the scale, we're talking really here uh, about uh, uh, eight milliohms. So it, it's really not a, a big difference, but this analysis provided uh, input into this system where five different modules were identified that contained faulty cells. Now, we don't know the cause of this, but it was probably due to manufacturing defects. And you can imagine that in the best case scenario, this is going to cause future problems with the performance and the lifetime of the system. And on the worst case, maybe an energy storage news article is written about it, uh, you know, not to be a doom and gloom necessarily. But one of the benefits here is that as stakeholders in energy storage, integrators, utilities, asset managers, uh, really anybody who has an interest uh, continues to build energy storage systems, this type of data can also be used to compare different types of systems and provide experiential learning as they continue to use certain platforms. But let's go to the second case example. So in this case example, now we're going to shift to voltage spreads. Now, voltage and temperature spreads at any level, but let's look at strings here. The graph that you see is the voltage spread, the highest to lowest uh, that is present uh, in a string. And this is typically done at a variety of state of charge, SOC levels, because different problems show up in different ranges of the state of charge. And you can see here that very clearly, again, you have this uh, yellow and blue line that are present showing an elevated voltage spread. And this is indicative of weak cells. And you know, our recommendation would be that these are replaced uh, to prevent uh, current and future problem. Uh, one other benefit here is that this provides input when, you know, the, in this particular example, the, the various stakeholders, including the battery OEM, uh, didn't really believe that there was a problem because the BMS data was accurate. And this provides some pushback towards replacement, LTSA claims, warranty claims, uh, and the whole lot to protect that capital investment. So these problems, if we go on one more, Sebastian, this digital commissioning process we talked about at the being, <clears throat> being necessary to solve problems at the beginning of operation before the commercial operation date. <clears throat> but in fact, as we, we further explored, these problems will continue on and cause availability problems. <clears throat> and where TWICE really shines is not, not necessarily identifying the problems that are present in the whole system, but again, the specific battery components and data that you can't get anywhere else. If you look at that left uh, graph, you can see here the gray bar going horizontally across is the desired operational state. And you can see there's two types of things that the general problems that we can look at. Uh, one is weak cells in the black line, where sure, over, over some period, the weak cell is going to be, be within the confines of the normal battery operation and the prescribed behavior. But at certain state of charge windows, that is going to drop immediately, lending to all sorts of problems and availability problems. The other, the other blue line there is the blue line, which is imbalanced cells. And to explain that a little further, if you look at the right graph, uh, imbalance cells occur when uh, you have within a module and then consequently within a, a string uh, or rack of batteries, you have uh, different states of charge. Uh, and you can see as you go to charge that, you uh, cannot fully charge all of the cells within the battery. And if you go to discharge, you can't discharge fully all of the cells. So what consequently happens is that there's a mismatch between the battery BMS reported state of charge and what the battery actually has, which then leads to penalties potentially in certain markets, uh, as well as incorrect operation. So we have talked 
through a couple of these case studies, and you might think that all is lost, woe is me, uh, but maybe you can go into the benefits here, Sebastian. Sure, yeah. So uh, what I just want to add that I heard of that project um, that they um, discovered uh, up to around 2% 2, 2 of the faulty modules. So just looking at a normal size project of 100 megawatt hours today, this is already more than 1 million worth of modules. Yeah, but so aside, aside from those, let's say, financial benefits, or um, let's also look at um, other benefits here. So um, we really enable you here to get a complete view of your battery project. So basically, at every step of the project, you can understand the performance of, of your system. So not only when it comes to the operation, but already basically in the construction phase, or let's say at the end of it. Yeah. So, and not this not only on a system level, but on a module level, as, as, as Ryan just explained. So if you are an EPC or a developer with no intention to own the storage for a long time, you can really also use this to improve your service offering towards your customers. And you can be, go beyond what you're required to do in terms of conventional commissioning. So without additional effort, but we come to the uh, without additional effort part. So if you're an asset owner, on the other hand, um, uh, yeah, you you will benefit from um, yeah the in the, from from the report. Yeah, you can really challenge um, what is what is brought to you, identify errors, mal malfunctioning of the BMS before it's too late. And what do I mean before it's too late? Before the the risk of the project is handed over to you, and then you are the full and only responsible. So coming again, and this is uh, another benefit to the to the availability increase. Yeah. So um, we learned that this is already a large um, challenge before. So, but of course, not all reasons for downtime are caused by batteries is issues. But as you can see here, quite a few are. Yeah. And the availability over a year can really be increased significantly. But so let's just look at the financial impact for for a second yeah so not 90 percent availability in this cast in this this is a custom example of a storage of 300 megawatt hours means that um 876 hours or 36 and a half days the storage was not available and this is more than a month actually so this means that for every hour um more than one thousand um dollars was um was lost left left on the table so in total one million so just Putting average, uh, sorry, uh, putting average twice costs next to it. Um, this will be around. So with you will already break even with an one point n one point eight percentage point increase. Yeah, and this doesn't even include, um, let's say, other benefits from from the software. And um, last but not least, we also want to look at how we are experiencing that many companies look at projects currently. Yeah, so you look at the average expected net present value, NPV, and then usually you decide to invest because on average the projects are profitable. And I mean, this is totally fine because otherwise we also wouldn't see such a um, rapid market growth. However, it's really these negative outliers here that hurt. Yeah? And they hurt in particular because you don't factor them in because again, you're looking at the average. So you really want to make sure to not belong to that small red group here at the beginning of the curve. And this is exactly what we want to encourage you to do. So we want to help you avoid having exposure to these outliers and normalize your project's bell curve if you want. And uh, before ending the webinar, handing over to Ryan, who summarizes some additional insights. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so the really cool thing about this digital commissioning process is that the last thing that anybody needs uh, in the commissioning process is another person milling about the site and another stakeholder to engage with. Because at this point in the process, you've probably gone through lots of permitting challenges, you've gone through lots of capital challenges, and maybe some problems are better left unsaid at the end of the day, uh, some people might say. But in fact, <clears throat> this actually requires no extra time and no extra labor, because again, it's just producing insights out of the data that is coming from the commissioning, normal commissioning process. In addition, this works at, at scale. So we've done this on systems in the uh, 
single digits and tens of megawatt hours up to hundreds of megawatt hours. And it really, it's just dealing with data. There's no, uh, the effort does not scale with the size and the capacity of the system. And finally, <clears throat> although certainly we have certain markets, the United States, Europe, Australia, that are, that are very hot in the energy storage, this does work as a global solution because again, it is remote and a digital commissioning process. So if we go on here, <clears throat> so we at TWICE talk, like to talk about batteries perhaps too much sometimes. Uh, and you're very much welcome to reach out to Sebastian or myself. Our contact information is there. And in addition, uh, amongst a variety of events uh, in the coming year, we'll be at Smarter E uh, later on in Germany this month, RE Plus in Las Vegas in September. And if you happen to be at the Energy Storage System Safety and Reliability Conference in Santa Fe uh, in just next week, uh, I'll be giving a talk there as well. Uh, we hope to see you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I've already seen that presentation before, so I already knew it was going to be, but it was really interesting, informative, and uh, entertaining as well, which is which is very nice. And speaking of people who like to talk about batteries, uh, you are in luck because it uh, looks like we've got quite a few of you on uh, online in this webinar so we had a lot of questions in um more than 10 questions so yeah safe to say we won't be able to do all of them there's one i can answer here right now from boyd uh who asked if the slides will be available to download they will be available to download boyd um so that's an easy one for me but for you two um Let's take it. Let's take through these. So there's some that are a little bit specific to some of the things you mentioned in the presentation, and there's some that are a little bit more general. But we'll try and get a blend of of the two. Um, and I'm not even sure if this first question is one for Twice, or perhaps it's for uh, the company that designed the project itself. But the um, you're talking in the first case study about um, screws not being talked correctly, um, in this you know causing faults or potential faults in a storage system and temperature rises. Uh, so Colin in the audience asks, surely um, a design uh, failure mode um, analysis uh, should have revealed things like that? I mean, I guess the simple answer is it should have, Ryan, but but it didn't. Um, any kind of views on, on that and, you know, what the role of manufacturer is versus what the role of someone someone like Twice is in, in that whole process? Yeah, sure, I can feel that. So, <clears throat> yeah, obviously a FMEA type of analysis or a hazard mitigation analysis and HMA uh, is something that should be done in practically every sort of energy storage system and is often required by codes and standards uh, as well. Um, I think that what you're seeing is as energy storage has progressed is from custom-made types of energy storage containers to more productized things. I think some of those potential torquing issues, of course, will go away when you have things that are more manufactured at scale. Uh, but what TWICE really offers is the ability to identify problems. We're not the people that are coming out and replacing the modules, but we're offering you the ability to very, very precisely pinpoint where an issue is. Cool. Okay. Okay. And, you know, in terms of something that's uh, maybe a little bit more general than, you know, that particular question um, is that, you know, there's a mention that um, majority of failures, I guess you could call it, or the highest incidence of failures occur in the first two years of operation. Um, so Marcus from the audience asks if there's any root cause analysis on those. Uh, now, Obviously, it's a bit broad for you guys to address, you know, all of the failures within the whole industry, but I'm presuming you have a pretty good idea of what sort of things um, do that, really, I guess. So, yeah, can you give us yeah. some examples there? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> there's a very good document, in fact, that's published by EPRI uh, that has uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, a bow tie chart, uh, essentially, of, of the causes and the potential mitigations and the, the consequences of energy storage uh, failures. But in my view, if you boil it down to three things, those are what cause energy storage incidents and problems. The first is problems with the battery and battery cells, whether that's a manufacturing issue or something else. 
The second is a physical design issue, improper cooling, maybe a corner of it is, is, is very hot, uh, improperly designed or even kinked cables or improperly designed bus bars and that sort of thing. And then the third is the control schemes and whether those are just being pushed to their limits or, or were not designed adequately. Sure, sure, okay. And, and I mean, there's, as I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more to delve into that. Sorry, I'm sorry to just say sure and move us on, but we've got so many <laughs> questions. I know it's such a big topic. We've got so many questions here that I think it would be great to get as many of them done. You know, there was one that I think probably you guys might have anticipated, but there's, and I won't just read out one person's name here because I think there are about three different folks in the audience asking essentially, um, so I'll read one example. Um, asking what data and at what resolution you need from a utility scale uh, battery storage owner slash operator. Uh, and someone else who asks who is making all the measure measurements, who is gathering the data. A um, couple more questions, but on a very similar sort of tack to that. So yeah, I don't know um, if you guys can give us a little bit of an insight there. Sebastian, would you like to feel that or would you like me? I don't, I don't want to give you an opportunity to speak to, but... No, go, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So <clears throat> during the commissioning process, as I've stated again, though, I, I, I've been involved in a lot of energy storage projects. And uh, one of the main benefits here is that this is not uh, additional extra work. <laughs> this, this is taking the data that is already coming off. So the questions there were, uh, who is responsible? So the normal commissioning process still takes place with, where you're ramping up and down the system, you're doing uh, pulse tests in terms of power uh, and, and running through a, a scheme to make sure everything works and it works at varying operational modes. And so we take that data and then produce these, these insights again. Um, and then as to what type of data, so this is all data that is available coming off of a BMS or a pass-through to an ESMS, an energy storage management system. We're talking about voltage, current, temperature, battery BMS reported state of charge, and voltage and temperature spreads. Uh, and at a time resolution of two seconds, typically, uh, for the voltage, current, and temperature, uh, and those are things that are typically easily accomplished by uh, a battery BMS. Cool, cool, okay. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think on a related note, really, I guess, you know, we talked about um, failures in the early uh, period of lifetime of a battery storage asset. So uh, audience member Joseph um, is asking, what do you see as the primary downtime driver or drivers plural, I guess is important to note, uh, impacting the relatively low availability numbers in the industry? Uh, is it batteries? Is it software? Is it power conversion systems? Uh, you know, what are some of those causes really, I guess, over, over longer lifetime rather than at the beginning, which might be tied to, you know, actual, let's say, teething problems with getting a project off the ground, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So typically the stakeholders in a project begin to notice the availability when there are power fluctuations uh, over time. So instead of having very smooth types of curves, you have a very sinusoidal random type of graph if you look at the kilowatts or megawatts uh, versus time resolution. And <clears throat> those problems show up, of course, from the inverter, right? Because you have inverters tripping. And so the causes there are, yes, yeah, sometimes inverters or inverter field replacement, replaceable units. Uh, but in a battery energy storage system, you really have to go a level down to suss out the problems that are present in uh, a cube or a section of the battery and then into the string module and even cell. So uh, imbalance issues uh, are, are really play a lot into uh, availability problems that show up. And uh, that's something that is not, not very easy to, to determine and graph. Okay, okay. And if I could uh, pitch a question at you at a, let's say, a slightly less um, uh, technical level, because I think it's important to note we've got a broad range of folks out there on the audience. And I want, want you all to know that, you know, all of your, your inputs and, you know, you're all important to, to us, clearly, and, and to everyone at Sway. So 
Uh, Kartik is asking exactly what you mean by string imbalanced, and and I guess you would have gone over it briefly. And it's maybe it's uh, you know a bit long to give a, a precise, well not precise, but to give a full detailed explanation. But can you just maybe just point that out to um, I guess those of us that maybe aren't quite as uh, you know at that at your level yet? I guess you could say. Sure. So very simply, the battery state of charge at any given level is a function of the voltage that's reported. And in these instances, the battery BMS reported state of charge is not accurate because uh, it, it, it is different than what it physically fundamentally is because you have a series of individual cells that are present in a system and they're not being either charged completely or discharged completely. So when you get to the end of an operation or the beginning of an operation, uh, there simply isn't the amount of, of electrons in the tank, so to speak. I mean, maybe that's a bad metaphor, but it, it just simply isn't there uh, when you go to do an operation. Excellent, thanks very much for that, uh, really concise. Okay, I'm gonna put you right on the spot now, I think, and hold you to uh, account for things that were said recently, apparently, at the uh, American Clean Power Conference um, that you alluded to. So uh, Tala from the audience um, says uh, that they heard twice share a comment that uh, you guys were able to detect catastrophic incidents six months before they occurred. Um, I guess a little bit of that was alluded to in the presentation, but is that something you can nail down to a, to a specific answer or is it just something that is part of what your suite of solutions kind of does? Or, or maybe there's an example you could give us in, in that regard, really, I suppose. Yeah, I can give you an example. So I, you know, obviously in a public webinar, we're not going to name the parties that were involved or anything like that. But uh, we've, we've had clients come to us that have had an incident and they uh, simply were giving us a test. And, and the, in this particular instance that we're talking about at American Clean Power, uh, they, they essentially gave us a test and homework to say, hey, we had this incident. Here is historical data from the energy storage system from, from months ago. Can you really look at this and determine when and where a problem will occur? And in that particular instance, we were able to look at the DC resistance and identify uh, both trends that were troubling during various state of charge windows, as well as anomalous behavior, anomalous DC resistance uh, in cells. And we were able to determine the, the exact place in the battery and pretty accurately about six months in advance when that would really become a problem and spike based upon the past behavior. Pretty powerful stuff, actually. I've been a, I've been a safety practitioner in energy storage for quite a while, and that's, uh, that, that's pretty impressive to be able to do that. Cool, cool. Excellent. So um, do you know what? I, I guess the audience can probably tell I'm really enjoying asking these. And uh, if it were up to me, we would continue asking these until pretty much they were all done. Um, but that said, I think in the interest of time, we're probably going to have to move on, I guess. Um, that said, there was um, a question that was quite highly upvoted from the audience. So I guess it's probably worth getting that asked while we're in the public forum. Um, and so Aaron is asking how the TWICE system is um, unique, or I guess differentiated, you could say, uh, compared to OEM systems, which provide monitoring and condition-based feedback. So don't necessarily want to hear trash talking of competition here, but um, yeah, what would you say is, you know, really the the defining reason why someone should come to a provider, let's say like twice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can, yeah, I can take this one. So I mean that's that's basically why twice is is there, why why we are on the market, because we rely on OEMs actually providing data to us. Yeah. But usually they don't do a lot yet with the data. Yeah. They have but we share usually the same vision and the uh, and the same um, yeah vision on on what to do with the data. So that's where twice comes into play, and then we usually have a very let's say partner approach and want to find out with the OEM, but also with the asset owner on how to best use that data. Yeah, and so we add an additional layer. Yeah, so we rely on the data that's there. We also don't need to 
put in any additional sensors or anything. But um, basically, our work starts where the, 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 the work of the OEM ends. Of course, there's an overlap, um, but that's what I meant with partnership abroad. So we usually um, uh, work closely to them to then add value to the to the, to the OEMs monitoring and um, yeah. Excellent, excellent, cool. Okay, guys, as I say, would love to keep answering these questions or rather would love to hear you guys keep answering these questions. Um, but I think that's about all we've got really got time for today. Um, just like to take this final opportunity to thank everybody who's joined us. And on a personal level, um, you know, I really want to thank everybody who is part of this industry and, and makes it what it is. Um, you know, from the from the people that are really kind of involved more from the decarbonization and to the people that are just, you know, really into the cool technology and, you know, somewhere in between the two is kind of where magic seems to happen. So just want to say thanks to all of you and really, yeah, keep, keep up your amazing hard work. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to you, Sebastian, and to Ryan. Thank you very much, Andy. A pleasure. Bye-bye. Awesome. We'll see you all next time. Thank you. Bye.